welcome and thank you for coming. And we'd be appreciative if you could turn off your cell phones for this uh, discussion for tonight. Um, the Under Institute of Politics is located in BKC 263 just across campus and we have an extensive internship program for students in political science and all the other fields. We bring speakers to campus and we take students to a Sacramento seminar. And so we would be very delighted if you would like to come by the Under Institute and find out more about our programs. So thank you very much for co-sponsoring this event and thank you for coming. And now I have to say it's always a particular pleasure to have with us Joe Sorrell, who actually went to this great school, has been a great, great friend of USC, has taught wonderfully popular classes uh, for years here, who runs Sorrell and Associates, whose son masquerades on this by the same name, running great organizations for Bill Gates. But the son uh, only comes close to the stature of the father. Uh, Joe Sorrell, some of you probably know, uh, started in politics in the 1950s, and when we get together, it's wonderful to swap stories about everything from the Humphrey campaign to the, to the Kennedy campaign and to wonderful campaigns ever since. Uh, he's also the immediate past president of the Italian-American uh, League, and he's a great friend of ours and a wonderful person to have as tonight's very special introducer. So my friend, Joe Sorrell. Very nice. That's a nice, that's a nice introduction I've had in a long time. I have a very simple task besides the fact uh, I wanted to also thank Dr. Brantown as the co-founder of the Unruh Institute. I'm delighted at all the wonderful things that she's doing and the Institute has done. I do want to acknowledge since you is the Council General representing the Republic of Italy, the Council General Diego Brazioli. <laughs> now there were a number of judges I'm not going to go down except that we, we, we should do, or you're supposed to be doing the uh, Judge Joe DiLoretto, so the judiciary is well represented. And if anybody gets in trouble tonight, <laughs> you're driving home tonight, you tell me you're a friend of Judge DiLoretto, it won't do you any good. Uh, now I'm going to get in trouble because I'm not introducing everybody else. My only role besides saying good evening, thank you for being here, it's great to be back on campus, introduce the chairman of the, of the organization that's, that's sponsoring this event along with Dr. Roundtown. The, uh, the chairman of the National Italian American Foundation. As an example, when Dr. Changli and I go to, uh, go to Italy at the end of this month, in about 10 days from now, Tommy, we're going to be visiting with the president of Italy, we're going to visit with the prime minister of Italy, and we're going to welcome a, a Los Angelino by the name of Ron Spoli, who's the new ambassador from the United States, not from Los Angeles, but from the United States to Italy. And uh, that's an example of what Dr. Changli has done, and so forth and so on, so we'll let it go with that. Let me introduce the, uh, the chairman so he can introduce, so you don't have to listen to any more speeches, uh, Dr. Ken Changli from Burlington, Vermont, wherever that is. <laughs> Wait a minute, I want to, and he's got a, and for the young ladies, for the young ladies who are here wondering what my son is doing, this is not my son, that's his son, a, a senior, in, a senior here at the university, Mr. Uh, Antonio Changli. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. Um, I'm first to tell you why we're having this conference before I get to introduce this great American. Um, it's great to be here at UCLA. <laughs> believe, believe me, I know the name of this university. I sent, a, I sent a tuition check twice a year for this guy. I know it quite well. Um, the National Italian American Foundation is, a, is an interesting organization. You know, basically what we do, and I, I, I say this as a disclaimer, I'm fourth generation. My great-grandparents came to America in, 18, in the 1880s. And so we, we try to save the best of this incredible culture that we were born, that we were born into. And um, you know, USC is uh, one of the great research universities of America. And yet I would bet that in the Daily Trojan, you will not see the word Italian-American in the entire year. And yet you know, the school has a priority of diversity and so the, the question is, why is that? I mean, don't we do anything that's newsworthy? And so, you know, we're here to dispel that. And if I, this is something I'm sure you don't know, but if I were to ask you which ethnic group could, could um, uh, boast that among its members had in the last decade, the chairmen of the New York Stock Exchange, the Philadelphia Stock Exchange, the New York Mercantile Exchange, the Chicago Board of Trade, the NASDAQ, the CEOs of IBM, 3M, Honeywell, 
Saks Fifth Avenue, Burberry's, McDonald's, Brooks Brothers, Ameritrade, TD Waterhouse, Countrywide Mortgage, Home Depot. I mean, and I could go on and on, AARP. It's, it's really quite an unusual record, and it's Italian-American is the answer. And so, you know, why haven't you heard of it? Uh, there was a, a poll um, in, 19, in the late 1990s, the University of Chicago study, in which they studied the 15 ethnic groups that are 1% of the population or more in America and their sociological characteristics. Now, there was one of those groups had the lowest rate of divorce, unemployment, people on welfare, people incarcerated, the highest rate of two-parent families, elderly family members that live at home, and families that eat together on a regular basis. Again, it's the Italian-American. And we're 8% of the population, so you know it's a, it's a secret. And so basically, we're here tonight to brag. And so what we have done is we created a program about six years ago in which we thought that we would go to America's best universities and we would bring the best Americans that we could find of the Italian heritage. And just to tell you some other places that we've been and what we've done this year, we brought Anthony Scalia to the University of Vermont, where I am. And it was very interesting, because I don't know if you know about Vermont, but he, <laughs> there were 1,200 people in a room that, that, that holds 900, and I'd say 1,199 of them were hostile. Uh, however, he got a standing ovation when he left. Uh, we've brought, uh, we just recently brought Dana Joya, who's the chairman of the uh, Council of the Arts to the University of Pennsylvania. And we had Jack Valenti at, uh, at Georgetown, the Motion Picture uh, Industry of America, and so many others. I, and, and, but we saved the very best for the University of Southern California. Now, th this next person, in some ways, is very hard to introduce, in some ways, very easy. First of all, he's, you live on this earth for eight, ten decades, maybe, if we're lucky. And there are so few of us that are recognizable by either their first name or their last name. And of course, Tommy Lasorda is that. He has um, the, this great quality, which I think is Italian, of loyalty. He's been a Dodger for 56 years. Um, his record is just incredible. He's uh, one of the few managers, I think it's 15, maybe it's 13, managers in the Baseball Hall of Fame. One of the greatest things that Tommy did was he took an amateur baseball team to the Olympics in the year 2000 and won a gold medal for our country. And that, that was such an incredible feat. It's right up there with the hockey team beating the Russians. And we're very proud of Tommy for that. Um, he's, one, he's probably the only person in Los Angeles that can drive around here without a driver's license and not get in trouble. Uh, it is truly a pleasure, a pleasure for me to introduce Tommy Lasorda, a great American. Thank you, man. thank you. Thank you very much. Is Vince still here, or did he leave? Yeah, how about it? Nice round of applause for one of the great quarterbacks in the history of football, Vince Ferragamo. We've got to mention him as an Italian. You know, uh, I, uh, the, one day the press came to me, and they said, uh, Steve Yeager is very, very upset with you. And I said, really, why? He said, because you made Mike Socia the number one catcher on his team because he's Italian. I said, that's a lie. That is a big, fat lie. I did not make Mike Socia the number one catcher because he's Italian. I made him the number one catcher because I'm Italian. <laughs> so anyway, it's good to be here with you tonight. I just, re I just got in from uh, Chicago. When I left the hotel this morning, it was about 12 degrees, and I couldn't wait until I got back to this weather here in California. So they asked me to come here to be part of this program. And, uh, you know, we're talking about Italian heritage. To me, I am very, very proud of that. I can remember when uh, they uh, brought me over to Italy to honor me in my father's home region. And I was the first American Italian to be brought over to Italy to be honored in his father's home region by the Italian government and received the, the, the highest medal that they present to anybody outside the country. 
And the guy said to me, well, why did they do that for you? They never did that for Joe DiMaggio or, or Vince Lombardi. Why you? And I said, I'll tell you why, me. Because two years ago, when they called me and said, uh, this is uh, Dr. Maxino Cicotti, I'm the head of the Baseball Federation in Italy, and we are now starting baseball in Italy, and we would like to bring you over here for two weeks to teach our coaches baseball. I said, what time of the year are you talking about? He said, the early part of February. I said, well, I can do that before spring training. He said, how much will it cost us to bring the manager of the Dodgers to Italy for two weeks to teach baseball to our coaches? And I said, are you Italian? He says, yes. I said, are you calling me from Italy? He said, yes. I said, well, let me tell you something. Italy gave me the greatest gift that any man could ever receive. Italy gave me my father. And I want to give something back to Italy. You don't pay me 10 cents. And the guy couldn't talk for what seemed like about two minutes. He never heard those words before. But I went over there for two weeks and worked with the coaches morning, noon, and night. It was my way of saying to Italy, thank you for giving me my father. So we're proud of our heritage. As, uh, as, as Kim said, maybe they, they don't know about it, but we know about it. We know how proud we are of our heritage. Now, when we're in the Olympics, Italy is in the Olympics, and we're going to play the Italian team. So they came to me and they said, hey, you know, you're going to go easy on these guys. <laughs> After all, you're a tie. Say, hey, let's get one thing straight here. My father was born in Italy, not me. I'm born in the United States, and we're going to kill those Italians. And by golly, we beat them. I said, you're, you're talking to the wrong man if you say you're going to let up because they're Italian. No way. We beat them. And uh, that's only because of the fact that we are all proud of what we're, what, where, our, where our parents come from or their parents come from. And... Uh, to be, uh, to be associated with what your parents have brought to you, each and every one of you here today, that's how they feel, we feel about our parents. My father spoke in broken English, and he had the greatest philosophy of life that I have ever met. And he taught me more about life than anybody. I've been with presidents, I've been with uh, professors, I've been with people of great, great significance all over the country and the world. But nobody could teach me the philosophy of life like my father did. He said, there, you got five brothers here. He said, you must love each other. And I use a lot of his ideas and philosophy to, when I managed the Dodgers for 20 years. So he said, you five boys must love each other. You must do everything you can to help each other. He said, if you five guys get on one end of a rope and pull together, you can pull a half a town with you. But if two of you get on one end of the rope, three of you get on the other end, you can pull all day long, and all you're doing is pulling against yourself. So I used that with my team. And he, he, he felt like that. Then he said to us, you are all fortunate because you are born in the greatest country in the world. Now, there's a man who is an immigrant. He said, you were born in the greatest country in the world, and you do everything you can to keep it the best country in the world. He said, if you have to go fight for your country, you must do it, and you might have to give up your life for your country. You do it. Now, here's a father talking about five boys that you might have to give up your life for your country. How much patriotism? you got to have a great deal of patriotism to, to, to believe that. But all five of us wore the uniform of the armed forces. I believe without a doubt, I was fortunate enough, and I thank God, to be able to be born in the United States of America. That's the land of opportunity. You could be anything you want to be in this country. All you got to do is want it. 
All you got to do is pay the price. And the price of success can only come through the avenue of hard work. Nobody can stop you from reaching your goals but yourself. You set your goals and you go after them with all the drive and all the determination that you have within you. And you can be whatever you want to be. And as I, I've spoken to many, many colleges, and I've gotten, well, I think I just got my sixth honorary doctorate degree from the University of Hawaii, Pepperdine, Long Beach State, Concordia, St. Thomas in Florida, and University of Phoenix. And I try to tell the youngsters the story about three young men who are graduating college. And the first father walked up to the first lad, put his arms around him. He said, your mother and I are very proud. You got yourself a good education. Go on, son. You're great. Here's a set of keys, our gift to you. The second father walked up to the second son and put his arm around him. He said, your mother and I are very proud. You got a good education. Here's a check for $10,000. Spend it as you see fit. And the third father walked up to the third lad and he put his arms around him. He said, your mother and I are extremely proud of you. You disciplined yourself. You made a lot of sacrifices. And you now walk around with a great education. Good luck, son. He said, wait a minute, Dad. He said, my buddy over there got a new car. My other buddy over there got a check for $10,000. You and Mom didn't give me anything. He said, that's where you're wrong. Your mother and I are giving you a much bigger and a much better present than they received. He said, what are you giving me, Dad? He said, I'm giving you the world. Go out and earn it. And this is what you're going to have to do. You're going to have to earn it. Whatever your goals may be in life, nobody's going to hand it to you. You're going to have to go out and earn it. So tonight, I'm honored to be here with you. I hope we put on a good show for you. And I hope that when you leave here, you'll be a lot better prepared for life than you walked in. And if you're not, then we have failed you. Thank you. Questions up on Okay. Thank you. See how Italian no, the gentleman is still there. Molte grazie. Si, pure tu. Tu sette prima. We were hoping we might ask you some questions about the question of the use of steroids okay. in sports. And I'd like to ask any of those present um, students and others if you would line up by either of the microphones. And now is your turn to be able to pose some questions uh, concerning public policy in sports. I don't know if you would want to comment on the latest I'll change I'll comment on anything you ask me. <laughs> you want me to comment or are you waiting for the question? What is it? Well, I'm just waiting to see how quickly we... I thought, I, I thought you were waiting for the question. Just give me a minute. Would you like to begin? Would you say your name before you ask your question? Uh, sure. Please. Good evening, Dr. Rantel. Uh, my name is Alex Michelson. Um, Mr. Lasorda, based on your experience and based on your knowledge of baseball, how many people actually were doing steroids? Did you view it as a rampant problem in the clubhouse going in and out? And do you think that the legislation will make, or the, the new steroid laws will make a significant difference? And if not, what more should be done? Well, first of all, I did not see anybody on the Dodger team when I managed for 20 years that I felt were taking steroids. In fact, I never knew anything about steroids. But then when you look at someone, and now you're thinking, maybe, hey, maybe that's it. That, maybe that one's taking it. Because I remember a ball player, and I don't even want to mention his name. He was about 160 pounds. He played for the Mets. The next year, he had a neck like this, and he was like this. I said, wait a minute. What's that guy been eating? <laughs> and this guy, this guy, four years from that day, was no longer able to play baseball. So taking steroids, I'm sure he did. I mean, I don't know for sure, but I feel certain that he did because of change in his body. So I never had a player that their body had changed like that. 
So that's why I feel that I don't think anybody was taking them when I, when I managed. What about after you managed during the, the 90s? After I managed, well, I've seen a lot of players that got real big. Uh, so I don't know. They, they can't get that big from eating just pasta. <laughs> no, I, I, I've seen a lot of them that I think took steroids, but I'm not going to say I'm certain that they did. But there's a lot of them like that. And, you know, the way they hit the ball, you got second basemen, little guys, hitting the ball 400 feet, hitting the ball the opposite field for home runs. Hey, how come? Say, wait a minute, something's wrong somewhere. But it's like the people say to me, yeah, but Tommy, they still had to hit the ball. Well, my wife knows that, and she don't know anything about the game. <laughs> sure, they have to hit the ball. But those fly balls that they used to hit that were caught on the warning track are now in the seats. And that's the difference between enhancing drugs, making you stronger, making you better. Now, let me give you another example. You take Stan Musial, Henry Aaron, Ted Williams, Joe DiMaggio. When these guys were 40, they quit because they were losing their hand-eye coordination. They were getting slower. They couldn't get the bat around quicker. Today, these guys are 40 years old and they're strong as bulls. So why? That's no different. Something this guy's taken has allowed him to have this strength and maintain it for even when he's beyond 40 years old. Does that answer your question? <laughs> yes. Thank you. Would you like to go ahead? Hi, my name is Whitney Worth. Um, I was wondering if you feel that the government needed to become involved in the steroid investigation and now the policy, or do you think that it should have been handled by Major League Baseball? A lot of people have asked me that question, and here's my answer. Yes, the government should be involved. And I'll tell you why. Because it's been reported that there are 300,000, 500,000 high schoolers taking steroids. Now, why are they taking steroids? These are the ones that this country has to worry about, those 500,000. The guys that are in the big leagues are taking it. They're gone. They gave up their life. They gave up their health for it. They're finished. But we got to stop those 500,000 from doing it simply because they look up to the major league players. They try to emulate them. They, uh, these youngsters don't want to be a, a, a cop or a, a senator or, or a chief of police. They want to be a major league baseball players like these guys they idol. I idolized players when I was a youngster. They meant everything in the world to me. I'd look for them. If, if, if Babe Ruth or Lou Gehrig or Hank Greenberg could come over when I was 15 years old and put their hand on my head and say, don't ever do anything wrong, son. I think I would have gone to become a priest because that's how much, that's how much I love these guys. That's how much I looked up to them. Now, the youngsters, those 500,000, are looking up to these major leaguers. See, they say, well, they're taking it. It's good enough for them. It's good enough for me. Now, we've got to stop it. And now... When the, we, the baseball had the worst drug rule of all the sports, there was nothing in the agreement that says that they could not take drugs. There was a player from the Angels. I don't know if you remember this, and I want to mention his name. But he was caught with heroin in a hotel room. The Angels suspended him. Two days later, he's put back in uniform by the arbitrator. So... The baseball rule was, oh, no, you can't test us because it's an invasion of my privacy. Well, they, they, they take pilots and they test them. They take uh, uh, judges, they test them. But they can't test me because that's the way it is. Now, if I'm paying you millions of dollars a year, I should be allowed to test you, and I should be allowed to test you every day. So this is what's happening. So now they've changed the rule due to the commissioner, due to Senator McCain, the president, and Jim Bunning. They've changed the rule, the baseball rule, now is very, very tough. Now if they're going to take it, they're going to find out that they're going to be in deep trouble. 
but before they could because we had the worst drug rule. But now you're going to see a lot of them go back to their natural way, and you're going to see they're not going to be hitting them balls out of sight. Thank you. Hi, I'm Angelina DiPatrillo Bucci. Are you um, Italian, Angelina? A little bit. <laughs> Um, within like the baseball world, are a lot of the coaches and managers and like higher up people are they trying to aid in the hiding of steroid use, or are they more for kind of uncovering like the players that are using steroids and trying to keep it? Under well, that, that's a very good question. I think baseball tried to hide it because they couldn't do anything about it, and they didn't want to ruin the name of the game of baseball. See, but now, now they're going to say something about it, and you know that's the same thing. I, I remember I went on television a number of years ago when I was managing the Dodgers. And it was on ESPN, if I remember correctly. And I said, I am sick and tired of people saying that taking drugs is a sickness. How is it a sickness if you put something in your own body of your own free will that, number one, is against the law, Number two, it's harmful to your body. Number three, all it will do is lead you down the path of de destruction. Are you trying to tell me that that is a sickness? That is a weakness because they didn't have the intestinal fortitude to turn them down and walk away from them. And by golly, I got a thousand letters and 998 said I was right. And the other two were drug addicts who said I was wrong. <laughs> but I come out and I said it. I don't care what anybody says. So when you take steroids, you're doing it for two reasons. Number one, to enhance your ability. And number two, to maintain your strength throughout all the time. And now they're going to find out how serious it is by taking them. And that's when these youngsters are going to stop taking it. And that's why Congress got involved with steroids. Thank you. Hi, Mr. Lasorda. My name is Nick Dietzen. And uh, I was just wondering with the uh, importance that baseball, just as uh, the national pastime and history, the importance, where do you think that the last 10 years or so will be um, viewed by just the baseball community and do you think that this new policy will help us like recover the you know integrity of like records and things like that yeah i believe that i believe it's going to make a big difference in baseball without a doubt and a lot of people are skeptical about the records that are put up there because somebody's taking steroids i mean where do you ever see a guy was going to hit 73 home runs I, I, I don't know. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's a tough situation, and we're trying to clear it up, and what needs to be cleaned up. And uh, we can get, them to, we get those youngsters to stop it, then we're, we're going to do our, our game a justice. Because baseball is, without a doubt, the greatest sport in this country. Now, people tell me about football, right? Oh, football this, football that. Football action football a lot of action football the next time you see a football game take a stopwatch with you and when that ball is center start it and when that ball ends that play ends stop it now what they play 60 minutes huh 60 minutes of football how many minutes do you think there's really action in the game huh if i told you there's maybe 11 minutes of action all they do is walk back to the huddle. <laughs> well, Ferragamo, he's, he was a great football player, and he's probably, he's probably thinking I'm crazy by saying what I'm saying. But everybody has an opinion, and that's my opinion. And I believe that. Because let me tell you something. I'm going to ask a question in a minute here. Everybody, any age or size, can play baseball. You want to play a football player? You got to be big, you got to be strong, you got to be fast. You want to be a basketball player? You got to be tall, you got to be fast. Baseball, everybody can play. Any size can play the game. Now, let me ask you how many of you in this room 
at one time or another has played football? Raise your hand. Okay. How many of you played basketball? Okay. How many of you played baseball at one time or another? Look at all the hands. Does this prove what I'm trying to tell you, Vince? Huh? Does it prove what I'm trying to tell you? <laughs> soccer. Yeah, soccer's a good sport. Okay, any other questions here? Hi, I'm Jonathan Horowitz, and I wanted to ask you, I know a lot of people look up to athletes as role models, but then at the same time, you sometimes hear athletes say, you know, we're, we don't want to be role models, we're just, you know, regular people. What responsibility do you think an athlete has, and how much of a, should they be held to a higher standard? I believe is this as much as I'm sitting here, that athletes have to be role models. Now, first of all, I remember a basketball player saying, I don't want to be a role model. Is he a role model with his family? He said he doesn't have to be a role model. Is he a role model with his family? He'll say yes, right? Then if he's a role model with his family, then he's a role model. See? They must, as people in the, that are in a position where they have come in contact with a lot of people, must be a role model. You must set yourself up as a person that the people could say to himself, I would like to be like that guy. That's what I think. Every, every player who's ever played that, look at Vince back there. I know Vince. He's a role model in his, in his field. A lot of youngsters wanted to be like him. You, don't ever, you never read anything about Ferragamo doing anything wrong. No way. Based, number one, he's Italian, so that, 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 that makes it. So that's, that's the point. They have to be role models. Hey, look, if I go, am um, I walking, let's say I walk in a bar, okay? And some guy gives me some lip and I get in a fight with him. Do they say, oh, that's Tommy Lasorda from Norristown, Pennsylvania? Or do they say, that's Tommy Lasorda from the Dodgers? I represent the greatest organization in baseball. And I must conduct myself at good a ways of everything.